OK. Bonjour et merci de vous être joint à nous aujourd'hui. Today, we will hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Howard New, et le Ministre des Transports, Monsieur Marc Garneau, sur le téléconférence. Dr. Tam, please. Good afternoon. Bonjour. I will start with the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 92,748 confirmed cases, including 7,414 deaths. And 50,684, or 55%, have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 1,751,000 people for COVID-19 to date, with about 5% of these testing positive overall. Over the past week, we have been testing an average of close to 29,000 people daily. As more and more restrictions are relaxed, places are reopening, and as the weather warms, we should all be feeling better, right? But this is not necessarily the case for many of us. Some still have concerns about being at higher risk for uh, COVID-19 of severe outcomes, and we may have anxiety about going into public places where it isn't easy to keep our physical distance. The reality is we have adapted staying at home into our daily routines over the weeks and months of the COVID-19 epidemic, and it has now become our habit. Some habits that we've developed, like more frequent hand washing and spending more time with our families, can be good things that we'll want to carry on with going forward. Other habits, like increasing alcohol consumption and not being as physically active as before, are clearly not so healthy. And we'll need, really need to put the effort in to replace these changes with healthier routines. The fact is, adapting to change is hard. And once we've made the change, it can be hard to go back to previous healthy habits. Some have compared this with reverse culture shock. Whatever it is, the discomfort and inertia we feel is real. Once we form the habit, it seems easier and less discomforting to just stick with the new routine. But whenever a new habit is having a negative impact, whether on our mental, physical or social well-being or otherwise, it's time to make a change for the better. I want people to know that if you are struggling with concerns, big or small, there is help and there are helpers, more than you know. Taking the next step can be as easy as deciding to talk to someone close to you. And if you don't have someone nearby, there are virtual resources available, such as the Wellness Together Canada portal, which includes a suite of tools that offer different levels of support to people depending on their needs. Available resources range from information and self-assessment tools to the opportunity to chat with peer support workers and other mental health professionals. Don't forget, when the sun is shining and you're ready to step out, you can wrap yourself in layers of effective public health protection to stay safe. Physical distancing, hand washing and cough etiquette topped up with a non-medical mask or face covering for when you can't keep your two meter distance from others. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Tam. And now I donne la parole to Dr. Howard New. Dr. New, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Bon après-midi. Je vais commencer par vous donner les derniers chiffres sur la COVID-19 au Canada. Il y a maintenant 92 748 cas confirmés, dont 7 414 décès et 50 684 personnes rétablies, soit 55 des cas. À ce jour, des laboratoires partout au Canada ont analysé les tests de dépistage pour la COVID-19 de plus de 1 751 000 personnes. Environ 5 d'entre elles ont obtenu un résultat positif. Au cours de la dernière semaine, nous avons testé une moyenne environ 29 000 personnes par jour. À mesure qu'on allège les, ris les restrictions, les endroits rouvrent. Et au moment où la température se réchauffe, nous devrions tous nous centrer mieux. Pas vrai? Mais ce n'est pas nécessairement le cas pour bon nombre d'entre nous. Certaines craignent toujours d'être hautement à risque, de voir leur état de santé s'aggraver grandement s'ils contractent la COVID-19. Et le fait d'aller dans des, des endroits publics où il est difficile de garder une distance physique avec les autres peut nous rendre anxieux. En réalité, nous avons adapté le concept de rester à la maison à nos activités quotidiennes au cours des semaines et des mois de pandémie de COVID-19, et c'est maintenant devenu une habitude. Nous voudrons sûrement conserver certaines bonnes habitudes 
que nous avons acquises, comme se laver les mains plus fréquemment et passer plus de temps en famille. Par contre, d'autres habitudes, comme boire plus d'alcool et ne pas faire autant d'activités physiques qu'avant, ne sont manifestement pas bonnes pour la santé. Nous devrons vraiment faire des efforts pour les remplacer par des activités plus saines. En fait, s'adapter au changement est difficile, et une fois que nous avons changé nos habitudes, nous pouvons avoir du mal à revenir à nos saines habitudes d'avant. Certains ont comparé cela à un choc culturel inversé. Peu importe de quoi il s'agit, la gêne que nous éprouvons et l'inertie dans laquelle nous vivons sont bien réelles. Une fois que nous avons acquis une habitude, il nous semble plus facile et moins gênant de la garder, tout simplement. Mais si la nouvelle habitude et des effets négatifs sur notre bien-être mental, physique ou social, il est temps de la remplacer par une meilleure habitude. Je veux que vous sachiez que, que si vous éprouvez des petites ou des grandes inquiétudes, de l'aide existe et des gens sont là pour vous aider. Et plus que vous le pensez. Vous pourrez, par exemple, décider de parler à un de vos proches. Et si vous n'avez personne à qui parler dans votre entourage, vous pouvez consulter les ressources virtuelles comme le portail Espace Mieux-être Canada qui renferme un ensemble d'outils qui vous donnent accès à différents types de soutien selon vos besoins. Les ressources disponibles sont variées. On y trouve autant de l'information et des outils d'auto-évaluation que la possibilité de discuter en ligne avec les travailleurs de soutien par les pairs et d'autres professionnels de la santé mentale. N'oubliez pas, quand le soleil brille, que vous êtes prêt à sortir, vous pouvez utiliser les mesures de protection de santé publique efficaces pour rester en sécurité. La distanciation physique, le lavage des mains et les règles d'hygiène respiratoire, en plus de porter un masque non médical ou d'une couvre-visage quand vous ne pouvez pas maintenir deux mètres de distance avec les autres. Merci. Merci, Dr. Kno. Et maintenant, je donne la parole au ministre des Transports, Marc Carnot. Marc, s'il vous plaît. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Frontline workers have been vital in Canada throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. While many people stayed home or switched to working from home, many people could not. This includes many who work in the transportation sector. J'aimerais remercier tous les intervenants du secteur des transports qui ont donné suite aux nombreuses mesures de protection que j'ai annoncées par le passé. Cependant, malgré les nombreuses nouvelles précautions et mesures prises, il y a encore des endroits dans le réseau de transport où les travailleurs doivent être à proximité de moins de deux mètres de leurs collègues ou voyageurs. Today, I'm announcing expanded requirements for face coverings uh, for workers and others involved in the transportation system to help reduce the risk of COVID-19. For aviation, effective Thursday, June the 4th, uh, existing requirements for face coverings for passengers will extend to flight crews and also airport workers in the restricted area of a terminal when they are not able to physically distance. Due to safety concerns, an exception is being made for pilots who are not required to wear face coverings while on the flight deck. À compter de jeudi le 4 juin à midi, les exigences actuelles relatives au port de couvre-visage pour les passagers s'appliqueront également aux membres d'équipage aérien et aux travailleurs des aéroports dans la zone restreinte lorsque l'éloignement physique ne peut pas être maintenu. En raison de sécurité, les pilotes ne seront pas tenus de porter un couvre-visage dans le poste de pilotage. In marine transportation, we are recommending that all workers have a face covering to be worn when physical distancing cannot be maintained and when they are required by local authorities. We are also recommending that rail operators make face coverings available for all workers. Keeping safety in mind, they should also ensure that workers, when possible, wear face coverings. Rail operators are also requested to work to ask passengers to wear a face covering when physical distancing cannot be maintained. Pour ce qui est des travailleurs du transport routier, un ensemble de pratiques sera bientôt établi pour l'utilisation d'équipements de protection individuelle et de couvre-visage afin de protéger 
les travailleurs et les passagers. Ces pratiques ont été élaborées en collaboration en, avec les provinces et les territoires et l'industrie. Elles s'appliqueront aux travailleurs du secteur du camionnage, du transport par autocar et du transport en commun. It's important to keep in mind that physical distancing of at least two meters, frequent hand washing, and other public health and hygiene practices are still the most effective methods to limit the spread of the virus. And the government of Canada continues to recommend that all Canadians limit non-essential travel. The measures, the measures announced today will better protect everyone involved in the transportation system. Passengers, support workers, customers, and essential transportation workers who continue to do incredible work ensuring our transportation system continues to function. Our highest priority remains Canadian safety and security. Face coverings for travelers and transportation workers are yet another measure in our multi-layered approach to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, on est prêt maintenant à répondre à vos questions. Merci, Madame la Vice-Première Ministre. As usual, we're going to start with three questions on the phone, one question, one follow-up, and then we will turn to the room. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Our first question, the première question, is from Hélène Bizetti avec Le Devoir. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Oui, euh, bonjour. Ma question serait pour euh, la ministre Freeland. Euh, la Grande-Bretagne a annoncé un assouplissement de ses règles migratoires par rapport aux gens issus de, de Hong Kong. Je me demandais si le Canada euh, envisageait quelque chose de similaire. OK, merci pour la question. Euh, le Canada est un pays qui accueille chaleureusement les immigrants. Euh, nous sommes fiers de ça. Et c'est une euh, raison pour euh, notre puissance en tant que pays. Les immigrants de Hong Kong, particulièrement, ont joué un rôle très important et jouent aujourd'hui un rôle très important dans notre pays. Et je pense que tous les Canadiens apprécient euh, le rôle qui joue notre communauté des immigrants de Hong Kong. Uh, le Canada continuera d'être un pays qui accueille les immigrants et les demandeurs d'asile d'autour du monde. Et je veux aussi souligner qu'il y a aujourd'hui 300 000 de Canadiens à Hong Kong, plus ou moins, uh, autour de ce chiffre. Et tous les Canadiens aujourd'hui à Hong Kong sont évidemment chaleureusement seront chaleureusement accueillir ici au Canada. C'est leur maison et ils ont toujours le droit de retourner chez nous, chez eux, au Canada. Merci. Uh, um... Excusez-moi, je vais répéter la réponse en anglais si je peux. Ça va? Oui, oui. Um, uh, Canada is a country that welcomes immigrants, and that is a source of great pride and a source of real strength for our country. Uh, the community in Canada of people who have immigrated from Hong Kong and their children and grandchildren uh, are is a really, really important community in our country. And I know that we all appreciate the contributions that Hong Kong Canadians have made and continue to make to our society every single day. Canada continues to be a country that welcomes immigrants and asylum seekers from around the world. And of course, in particular, when it comes to Hong Kong, there are roughly 300,000 Canadians currently living in Hong Kong. All of those people are Canadian. And of course, dear Canadians living in Hong Kong, you are very, very welcome to come home anytime. Thank you. Oui, 
Et en supplémentaire, j'aimerais revenir sur la question euh, des annexions de territoire par Israël. Vous avez des, euh, des anciens diplomates et des anciens ministres qui vous ont demandé de dénoncer les intentions d'Israël plus vigoureusement. Monsieur Trudeau a eu des propos euh, hier, euh, mais ces gens-là disent que ce n'est pas suffisant et que le Canada devrait faire un peu comme ce qu'il avait fait dans le cas de l'annexion de la Crimée par la Russie et qu'il initie un mouvement international pour non seulement dénoncer, mais créer un mouvement qui amènerait Israël à abandonner son projet. Alors, j'aimerais vous savoir, puisque vous avez été une de celles qui a été très active sur la Crimée, euh, envisagez-vous de lancer un quelconque mouvement pour faire en sorte qu'Israël n'annexe pas les territoires euh, comme la vallée de Jourdain. Merci. Euh, le premier ministre s'est exprimé très, très clairement euh, sur cette question. Euh, il a eu aussi des conversations avec euh, les deux leaders en chef d'Israël sur cette question. La position du Canada, qui est une position du long durée de cette question, euh, n'était pas changée et le premier ministre et tout le gouvernement continuera d'exprimer euh, cette position très clairement. Merci. Merci, Madame la Première ministre. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, is from Stephanie Levitt with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking our questions. My first one is for Dr. Tam. And I wondered if I could ask you about your assessment of vaccine research progress in Canada, given that Britain and the U.S. are now both promising big rollouts of hundreds of millions of doses as early as this fall or 2021. I'm just wondering, what's your sense of how we're doing to produce something here at home or making sure we have enough from overseas? So I think um, vaccine uh, research and development is very much an international effort. And this is an incredible amount of work uh, with, as far as I know, uh, well over 100 candidates that are currently being investigated at various stages. So it is very encouraging to see some of the international trials going ahead. And we do have um, uh, some of this um, clinical vaccine development going on in Canada. Uh, some of them are still at a preclinical stage. Uh, but I think as uh, we had highlighted a little earlier on, there is one uh, clinical trial that was starting Um, in Canada in uh, phase one. So uh, again, we're making all efforts, um, not just on the research end and the clinical trial end. The clinical trials are very important because you need to establish safety, the dosing and the effectiveness of the vaccine. So it is a bit of a um, rigorous process at the same time as we want to accelerate um, accelerate the development. So um, that is definitely we're part of the global effort. Um, but we're also, of course, looking at beyond the, the research and the clinical trials to um, uh, look at the actual capacity uh, for vaccine um, development and, and manufacturing all the way to getting uh, equipment ready uh, for the time uh, should we have a vaccine. So that, that I think that uh, uh, Minister Nan had uh, talked about syringes and all of that. So, so we're looking at the whole um, suite of measures right now. Stephanie, follow-up? Yes, thanks. My follow-up is for Deputy Prime Minister Freeland. Um, earlier this morning, and the NDP leader Jagmeet Singh said that in failing to stand up to Trump, to outwardly condemn some of the things he has said in recent days, that's to be complicit with him. What's your response to that? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Stephanie. Look, I think that the most important response of any Canadian political leader has to be to understand our own responsibility for what happens here in our own country. I think our most important response has to be to not be complacent about racism in Canada, to be very clear that anti-Black discrimination is real here in Canada, to be very clear that systemic discrimination is here and is real in Canada, and to be very clear that unconscious bias is here and is real in Canada, and to be clear that we as a country 
have to work really, really hard to fight anti-black racism and all racism in our country. And really critically to realize this is a problem for us and to think about and to work on what we need to do to fix it and to listen really hard to the voices of racialized and black Canadians. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. Our next question. Our prochaine question is from Dina Dib avec la Presse canadienne. Please go ahead. Have la parole. Oui, bonjour, Madame Freeland. Je voudrais qu'on reste sur, sur ce même sujet. J'ai entendu plusieurs fois euh, le mot Canada dans, dans votre réponse. Et je pense que la question, c'était au sujet de ce qui se passe aux États-Unis. Il y a maintenant toutes sortes de théories à propos du silence de M. Trudeau qui a fait la manchette partout sur la planète. Alors, j'aimerais vous entendre, vous, comme vice-première ministre. Est-ce que le silence de M. Trudeau était un message euh, décidé, entendu, calculé. Est-ce qu'il y a un message du gouvernement du Canada dans ce silence ou bien non, c'était simplement euh, spontané? Je pense que la réponse hier du premier ministre était éloquente et excellente. Merci. I think et donc, I je... think that... Excusez-moi, Lina, je vais euh, oui, me allez... répéter en anglais, OK? Uh, I think the Prime Minister's answer yesterday was excellent and it was eloquent. Lina en suivi. D'accord. Et donc, dans ma suivi, dans sa réponse, vous incluez le silence? Le réponse du Premier ministre était le réponse du Premier ministre. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. We'll now turn to the room, starting with Crystal from Global. Hi, my question is for the Deputy Prime Minister. A growing number of Canadians, including the National Institute on Aging, are calling for your government to include long-term care under the Canada Health Act to force full reporting and information from provinces and territories and accountability for how the federal health care dollars are spent. What, if any, consideration are you, go are you giving to doing this? Uh, thanks for the question, Crystal. And I think that all Canadians are rightly very concerned about what we have learned has been happening in some long-term care facilities in Canada. And I want to take a moment to thank the amazing women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces who are literally saving lives every day and whose report, I believe, uh, will turn out to be a historic document and really draw our attention to some of the problems there. We are committed to working very hard and closely with the provinces and territories to really profoundly transform long-term care in Canada. What we have learned has been happening cannot continue. We have to make it better and we will. We also really believe that it's important to do this work in close collaboration with the provinces. It does fall under their jurisdiction. And I do want to say one of the strengths that Canada has had thus far in response to the coronavirus crisis is we've found a way to all work together including the federal government and the provinces and territories. And that's something that we're committed to continuing to do. My next question is also for the Deputy Prime Minister. Jagmeet Singh is calling for some specific measures to combat racism, legislation to end racial profiling in the CBSA, CSIS and the RCMP, and some kind of action to end over-incarceration and criminalization of black and indigenous people. Are those things your government is prepared to do? And if not, what specific t steps are you prepared to take? Uh, I do think that uh, it is really important for us to take this moment to look specifically at what we as a country and what we as a cover government can continue to do to combat racism, to combat anti-black racism. You asked specifically about police, and let me just say that there can't be any tolerance for racism or bias in any police force in Canada. Racial profiling is unacceptable, and our government is absolutely committed to upholding the Canadian Charter of Rights. Thank you. Bruce? 
Uh, just maybe a follow up, Bruce Campion Smith, the Toronto Star, just to follow up to that, Deputy Prime Minister. We, we have heard rightly strong condemnations of, of, of discrimination, racism, and, and these unconscious biases, but but I'm not sure words alone will fix it. So I'm just wondering, you know, as, will the government choose this moment to, to lay out some action, you know, to, to act in the spheres it can to, to you know, reduce these, these incidents? And if so, what? Um, well, first of all, let me say congratulations, Bruce, on your upcoming move. Um, and uh, when it comes to racism in Canada, uh, anti-black racism, but I think the coronavirus has also drawn our attention uh, to uh, racism against uh, people of Asian descent. Um, we have to take it seriously in our country. I do think that there is more that we need to do as a country and as a government, and we will be acting. We'll have more to say about this. Okay. Dr. Tan. And I do also, I just, I'll say one yeah. other thing about it, which is I just really would point to the really important work that Minister Bardish Chager has been doing and continues to do on this issue. Sorry. A uh, uh, question maybe to Dr. Tam. You know, uh, work under, is underway on the vaccination, of course, but I assume as well work's underway to, to just improve treatments. And I'm just wondering whether over the course of the coronavirus, whether you've seen a change in mortality rates as you know, doctors and health staff have gotten better at understanding kind of the progression of the disease and, and how to treat it. Yes, so um, I think there's some um, pulling together of international data on clinical management. And um, certainly the intensive care networks have been sort of working together to look at the more details on intensive care itself, because for the most part, uh, right now is supportive care, um, given that there's no actual specific uh, antivirals or other treatments. So I think there's progress on that front, but I can't comment it because I'm not an intensive care specialist, but I know that that information is being pulled together. The understanding of the science behind the um, clinical uh, spectrum, as well as the underlying uh, pathology, if you like, is evolving. So I think there's some um, increasing understanding of the inflammatory response. Um, and, and some of these, the, the kids we talked about a little bit uh, with the uh, multi-system inflammatory um, uh, syndrome, where uh, treatments such as um, the traditional ones for Karasaki disease, like immuno intravenous immunoglobulin seems to work as well. Um, and then more research is now going on about the, um, the, the um, the virus's role in um, vascular disease. So I think all of that will um, result in a growing body of evidence, but it's a very, very active, not just domestic, but international body of research. So um, I can't say whether that has impacted the morbidity mortality over time as yet. Um, most of the Canadian mortality, as we all know, um, are now really related, that like 82% to long-term care homes. Thank you, Doctor. Back. Hi, Mr. Freeland. Mackenzie Gray from CTV News. Uh, there's a video that's been circulating online from Cape Dorset, Nunavut. An RCMP officer uh, hit a man who appeared to be drunk with his car. He opened the door and hit him. He then arrested him on the ground with five of his other colleagues uh, while onlookers filmed this. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see the video, so if, if you haven't, um, that's fine. Um, but uh, one of the things that the MP for none of it, uh, NDP MP, has brought up is the idea that uh, if police officers had body cameras on in these situations and other situations up north uh, where the RCMP has been involved in an arrest, uh, they would have a better understanding about uh, what happened and they'd be able to get to the bottom of things better. Uh, is that something that the government is considering mandating the RCMP to do? Uh, well, thanks for the question, Mackenzie. And I haven't seen the video that you mentioned, um, so I can't comment on it specifically. What I can say is that, of course, uh, you know, the RCMP do an important, essential job in our country, and I think we're all very grateful to them for protecting us. Any instance of police brutality or mistreatment of Canadians is completely unacceptable. And, you know, I think our country is today particularly aware of and concerned about racist behavior 
by police officers, and it's right for us to be concerned about that. And that, of course, is entirely unacceptable by any police force in Canada, very much including the RCMP. And I do think that this is a moment when all of us in our country need to reflect on both what we are doing and specific measures and steps we can take to fight racism. You've spoken, uh, the Prime Minister's spoken, many cabinet ministers have spoken about being an ally, the importance of uh, fighting and combating anti-black racism. The steps that many regular Canadians are taking is protesting, doing things online to show their solidarity uh, with their fellow Canadians. Uh, there are many protests planned for this weekend, including here in Ottawa and Toronto. Are you planning on attending any of them? Um, that's a good question, Mackenzie. And... Uh, in my day, I have gone to quite a few protests. My mother was a pioneering feminist in Alberta, so take back the night marches were a familiar form of childhood activity for me. Um, and uh, I think it's a good question and something for all Canadian leaders to think about. One thing that I will say to people protesting in Canada is... Peaceful protest is a valued and important and really useful form of political expression. Uh, it's uh, a way that uh, you as a citizen show your commitment to your society. Uh, I think Dr. Tam has offered some advice earlier this week about protesting in the age of coronavirus because there's obviously a concern where uh, when we are advising against any large groups getting together, a protest by definition is a group of people getting together. And I think it's also something we all need to be concerned about. Um, and I would say... Uh, as Dr. Tam has already said, really important also to realize that coronavirus is still here, important to wear masks, important to have sanitizer, uh, and really to take those health precautions seriously. It hasn't gone away. So you're go? Oh, you're not going to go? I, I, I mean, the, the coronavirus issue is a really serious one also to think about in that context. And I will just say, as a mother... Um, I have been struggling very hard to say to my children that they can't see their friends and they can't be in groups. And so setting an example on that front is also an important one for me. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Mackenzie will let that slide in memory of Julie Van Dusen. <laughs> we'll take one last question on the phone. Operator. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, our prochaine question is from Mélanie Marquis with La Presse. Please go ahead, have la parole. Merci. My question is for the Minister Garneau. Uh, pourquoi avoir attendu un mois, ou en fait, euh, un mois après avoir annoncé l'obligation de port de masque pour tous les passagers, euh, avant de l'étendre donc aux membres d'équipage aérien puis aux travailleurs euh, aéroportuaires? Euh, merci pour la question, euh, Mélanie. Euh, certainement, c'est une situation qui évolue et puis euh, on a reconnu que c'est important que les passagers portent des masques et on l'a annoncé. Et euh, je suis d'accord avec vous que euh, il faut faire les choses aussi rapidement que possible et euh, on aurait pu le faire un petit peu plus tôt, mais euh, la bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'on le fait et on l'annonce aujourd'hui. En suivi. Oui, bien là, forcément, je vais vous demander d'élaborer de, là-dessus. M. Garneau, vous dites qu'on aurait voulu le, le faire plus tôt. Qu'est-ce qui, euh, qu qui a bloqué? Il y avait une réticence du côté des compagnies aériennes? Euh, non, euh, c'est simplement une question d'organiser euh, des mesures euh, en consultant avec tout le monde. Ce n'est pas simplement une question de parler avec les lignes aériennes. Euh, Aujourd'hui, les annonces touchent les ports, euh, les compagnies ferroviaires touchent les provinces parce qu'on parle de transport en commun. Et toutes ces choses-là 
prenne du temps et j'ajouterai que dans le cas des provinces, il faut respecter les mesures qui sont prises par les autorités euh, responsables pour la santé dans les provinces. Alors, il y a une certaine discussion qui doit avoir lieu avant d'arriver à une décision. Alors, toutes ces choses-là prennent un peu de temps et c'est pour ça qu'il euh, y a eu un délai. Et puis, euh, mais la bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'on met ces, euh, ces mesures en place maintenant. Merci, Monsieur le ministre. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse pour aujourd'hui. That's it for today. Thank you, everyone.